As we continue our series, we were studying the Ark of the Covenant. Specifically, we were studying the pot of manna and how that came into existence and the meaning of the pot of manna for us today. I would like to remind us before we move on about the statement in Testimonies of Ministers, page 411, paragraph 1. Testimonies of Ministers, page 411. Satan has laid every measure possible that nothing shall come among us as a people to reprove and rebuke us and exhort us to put away our errors. But there is a people who will bear the ark of God. Some will go out from among us who will bear the ark no longer, but these cannot make walls to obstruct the truth, for it will go onward and upward to the end. In the past God has raised up men, and He still has men of opportunity waiting, prepared to do His bidding, who will go through restrictions which are only as walls dubbed with untempered mortar. When God puts His Spirit upon men, they will work. They will proclaim the word of the Lord. They will lift up their voice like a trumpet. The truth will not be diminished or lose its power in their hands. They will show the people their transgressions and the house of Jacob their sins. We remember that there are three items that were placed inside the ark. I would like to turn again to Hebrews chapter 9, verses 3 and 4. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 3 and 4. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. Keep in mind that inside that ark, inside that ark itself, there were three items. Golden pot that had manna, Aaron's rod, and the tables of the covenant. When the temple was built by, in the time of Solomon, we find the wording is very unique in Second Chronicles chapter 5 and verse 10. Second Chronicles chapter 5 and verse 10. There was nothing in the ark save the two tables which Moses put therein at Horeb when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt. So by the time of Solomon, Aaron's rod and the pot of manna were missing. These things, as you recall, because they, they were removed and because they, because the children of Israel continued rejecting God, the, they finally rejected the law of God and as a result, God removed the entire ark from them. But after the great disappointment in 1844, when God's people once again left Egypt, the Advent people left Egypt, God revealed something in the year 1847. We find this in early writings, pages 32 and 33. Early writings, pages 32 and 33. The Lord gave me the following view in 1847. While the brethren were assembled on the Sabbath at Topsom, Maine. In the holiest I saw an ark, on the top and sides of it was purest gold. And it goes on and describes that ark. Down further it says, In the ark was the golden pot of manna, Aaron's rod it budded, and the tables of stone which folded together like a book. In other words, that Aaron's rod which was once in the earthly ark was removed from this earthly ark and was placed in the ark up in heaven. That's where it was placed. Those who are His people today, those who are bearing His ark, need to understand the meaning of these items and also to be able to live by them. And so, in order to do so, I would like us to turn to the book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 16 and 17. And these are the two chapters which describe the giving of Aaron's rod. In order to get a whole picture, I would like to first of all go ahead and read the entire two chapters first. First, let's read it, and then we can analyze the meaning and the reason for the giving of Aaron's rod. Beginning with verse 1. 
Now Korah, the son of Izhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, and Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men. And they rose up before Moses with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown. And they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said unto them, Ye take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Wherefore then lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. And when Moses heard it, he fell upon his face. And he spake unto Korah and unto all his company, saying, Even tomorrow the Lord will show who are his and who is holy, and will cause him to come near unto him. Even him whom he hath chosen will he cause to come near unto him. This do take you censers, Korah and all his company, and put fire therein, and put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow, and it shall be that the man whom the Lord doth choose, he shall be holy. Ye take too much upon you, ye sons of Levi. And Moses said unto Korah, Here I pray you, ye sons of Levi, seemeth it but a small thing unto you that the God of Israel hath separated you from the congregation of Israel, to bring you near to Him to do the service of the tabernacle of the Lord, and to stand before the congregation and minister unto them? And he had brought thee near to him, and all thy brethren, the sons of Levi, with thee, and seek ye the priesthood also. For which cause both thou and all thy company are gathered together against the Lord. And what is Aaron that ye murmur against him? And Moses said to call Dathan the Byram, the sons of Eliab, which said, We will not come up. Is it a small thing that thou hast brought us out of the land that floweth with milk and honey? to kill us in this wilderness, except thou make thyself altogether a prince over us. Moreover, thou hast not brought us into a land that floweth with milk and honey, or given us an inheritance of fields and vineyards. Wilt thou put out the eyes of these men? We will not come up. And Moses was very wroth and said unto the Lord, Respect not thou their offering. I have not taken one ass from them, neither have I hurt one of them. And Moses said unto Korah, Be thou and all thy company before the Lord, thou and they, and Aaron, tomorrow. And take every man his censer, and put incense in them, and bring ye before the Lord every man his censer, two hundred and fifty censers, thou also and Aaron, each of you his censer. And they took every man his censer, and put fire in them, and laid incense thereon, and stood in the door of the tabernacle, and the congregation with Moses and Aaron. And Korah gathered all the congregation against them unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the congregation. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from among this congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. And they fell upon their faces and said, O God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin, and wilt thou be wroth with all the congregation? And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the congregation, saying, Get you up from about the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And Moses rose up and went unto Dathan and Abiram, and the elders of the Israel followed him. And he spake unto the congregation, saying, Depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men, and touch nothing of theirs, lest ye be consumed in all their sins. So they got up from the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan and Abiram on every side. And Dathan and Abiram came out and stood in the door of their tents, and their wives and their sons and their little children. And Moses said, Hereby ye shall know that the Lord hath sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them of mine own mind. If these men die the common death of all men, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord hath not sent me. But if the Lord make a new thing, and the earth swallow up her mouth, and swallow them up with all that appertain unto them, and they go down quick into the pit, then ye shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord. And it came to pass, as he had made an end of speaking all these words, that the ground clave asunder that was under them, and the earth opened their mouth, and swallowed them up, and their houses, and all the men that appertain unto Korah, and all their goods. They and all that appertained unto them, went down alive into the pit. And the earth closed upon them, and they perished from among the congregation. And all Israel that were round about them fled at the cry of them, for they said, Lest the earth swallow us up also. 
And there came out a fire from the Lord and consumed the 250 men that offered incense. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, that he take up the censers out of the burning, and scatter thou the fire yonder, for they are hallowed. The censers of these sinners against their own souls, let them make them broad plates for a covering of the altar, for they offer them before the Lord, therefore they are hallowed. And they shall be a sign unto the children of Israel. And Eleazar the priest took the brazen censers wherewith they that were burnt had offered, and they were made broad plates for a covering of the altar to be a memorial unto the children of Israel that no stranger which is not of the seed of Aaron come near to offer incense before the Lord that he be not as Korah and his company as the Lord said unto them by the hand of Moses. But on the morrow all the congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron saying, Ye have killed the people of the Lord. And it came to pass when the congregation was gathered against Moses and against Aaron that they looked toward the tabernacle of the congregation and behold the cloud covered it and the glory of the Lord appeared and Moses and Aaron came before the tabernacle of the congregation and the Lord spake unto Moses saying get you up from among this congregation that I may consume them as in a moment and they fell upon their faces and Moses said unto Aaron take a censer and put fire thereon from off the altar and put on incense and go quickly unto the congregation and make an atonement for them for there is wrath gone out from the Lord the plague is begun and Aaron took as Moses commanded and ran into the midst of the congregation and behold the plague was begun among the people and he put on incense and made an atonement for the people and he stood between the dead and the living and the plague was stayed now they that died in the plague were 14,700 besides them that died about the matter of Korah. And Aaron returned unto Moses unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and the plague was stayed. Now chapter 17. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and take of every one of them a rod, according to the house of their fathers. Of all the princes according to the house of their fathers, twelve rods, write thou every man's name upon his rod. Thou shalt write Aaron's name upon the rod of Levi, for one rod shall be for the head of the house of their fathers. And thou shalt lay them up in the tabernacle of the congregation before the testimony where I will meet with you. And it shall come to pass that the man's rod, whom I shall choose, shall blossom, and I will make to cease from me the murmurings of the children of Israel, whereby they murmur against you. And Moses spake unto the children of Israel, and every one of their princes gave them a rod apiece, for each prince one according to their father's houses, even twelve rods, and the rod of Aaron was among their rods. And Moses laid up the rods before the Lord in the tabernacle of witness. And it came to pass that on the morrow Moses went into the tabernacle of witness, and behold, the rod of Aaron for the house of Levi was budded and brought forth buds and bloomed blossoms and yielded almonds. And Moses brought out all the rods from before the Lord unto all the children of Israel, and they looked and took every man his rod. And the Lord said unto Moses, Bring Aaron's rod again before the testimony, to be kept for a token against the rebels, and thou shalt quite take away their murmurings from me, that they die not. And Moses did so, as the Lord commanded him, so did he. The children of Israel were on their journey to the promised land. They had arrived on the border. They were told to go in, and they refused to go in. They said, oh no, we cannot go into the land. And then, when God says, now you shall not go into the land, then what do they do suddenly? Then suddenly they changed their mind and said, oh no, we must go in the land. And they went to fight to take possession of the land. When many of them were killed, they came back defeated, and they, at that time, Korah instigated this rebellion. This rebellion was against the leadership of Moses and Aaron. In the first place, let us examine who appointed Moses and Aaron to leadership. Number 16, verse 11, made it very clear. Number 16, verse 11, For which cause both thou and all thy company are gathered together against the Lord. And what is Aaron that ye murmur against him? They were not murmuring against people. They were actually murmuring against the Lord. In Patriarchs and Prophets, page 369, 
it tells us when Moses and Aaron actually could leave their position because God appointed them to leadership. Now when could they leave that responsibility? It says, The humble shepherd's life of Moses had been far more peaceful and happy than his present position as leader of that vast assembly of turbulent spirits. Yet Moses dared not choose. In place of a shepherd's crook, a rod of power had been given him, which he could not lay down until God should release him. So God gave Moses the responsibility. God chose Moses. And once God chose Moses, Moses could not leave that alone until God released him. Now, the person that led out in the rebellion was by the name of Korah. In Numbers chapter 16, verse 1, it identifies the lineage of Korah. Korah was actually Moses and Aaron's cousin. He was a relative. Izhar, the father of Korah, he was Moses' uncle. And it was at this time that Korah began to be jealous of his relatives who had responsible positions in Israel. He was not happy with his responsibility. And so in Numbers 16, 10, it shows us what he was really after. Numbers 16, verse 10, And he hath brought thee near to him, and all thy brethren, the sons of Levi, with thee, and seek ye the priesthood also. You remember that the children of Israel on Mount Sinai, most of them lost the responsibility of leadership. Only the tribe of Levi was able to have that, the priesthood. And among the tribe of Levi, only Aaron's family were chosen to the priesthood. And Korah was not happy with that arrangement. He wanted more than that. In Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, page 296. Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, 296. It says, The Lord knew that Korah was rebellious at heart and was secretly at work against Moses in the congregation of Israel, although his rebellion had not yet developed itself. So he was working secretly. He was working quietly so that nobody can find out about what he was doing. And then it developed itself in secret. The Lord made an example of Miriam as a warning to all who might be tempted to rebel against Moses. So just before this rebellion, Miriam also rebelled. And God made her an example so that the others would not carry on their rebellion. Korah was not satisfied with his position. He was connected with the service of the tabernacle, yet he desired to be exalted to the priesthood. God established Moses as the chief governor, and the priesthood was given to Aaron and his sons. Korah determined to compel Moses to change the order of things whereby he should be raised to the dignity of the priesthood. To be more sure of accomplishing his purpose, he drew Dathan and Abiram, the descendants of Reuben, into his rebellion. You see, Dathan and Abiram, by right, they should be priests because they were descendants of Reuben, the firstborn. But it was because of Reuben's sin that that responsibility was taken away from him and eventually was given to Levi. But what does the Bible say should be our attitude? Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have, for he had said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So it says here we should be what? We should be content with such things as we have. And that means also in positions that we may have in the work of God. Now, these people were not satisfied with their position. Now, not only were they not satisfied. If Moses and Aaron had changed the order of things and given them the responsibility to be priests like themselves, they would not have been happy. They would not have been satisfied to say, okay, I am happy now to be priest. No. What else? What were they really after? Patriarchs and Prophets, page 395. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 395. The judgments visited upon the Israelites served for a time to restrain their murmuring and insubordination. 
but the spirit of rebellion was still in the heart and eventually brought forth the bitterest fruits. The former rebellions had been mere popular tumults arising from the sudden impulse of the excited multitude. But now a deep, late conspiracy was formed, the result of a determined purpose to overthrow the authority of the leaders appointed by God Himself. They were not satisfied to become priests. They were not satisfied until they overthrew the authority of Moses and Aaron. How could they arrive at such a position? How did they get to that point? Patriarchs and Prophets, page 397. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 397. Jealousy had given rise to envy and envy to rebellion. Jealousy had given rise to what? To envy and envy to rebellion. So it all began with what? Jealousy. And in the work of God in these last days, we are especially as workers to guard against this one. Because this is what happened with Korah. He was elevated to a position and he began to be jealous of someone else's position and finally became envious and this eventually led to rebellion. It says they had discussed the question of the right of Moses to so great authority and honor until they had come to regard him as occupying a very enviable position which any of them could fill as well as he. And they deceived themselves and one another into thinking that Moses and Aaron had themselves assumed the positions they held. The discontented one said that these leaders had exalted themselves above the congregation of the Lord in taking upon them the priesthood and the government. But their house was not entitled to distinction above others in Israel. They were no more holy than the people, and it should be enough for them to be on a level with their brethren who were equally favored with God's special presence and protection. They said, you know, they should be happy to be equal to everybody else, and they should not be so taken to such responsibility among themselves. In Page Treasure Prophets, page 403, again it gives these points a little bit clearer. In the rebellion of Korah is seen the working out upon a narrower stage of the same spirit that led to rebellion of Satan in heaven. It was pride and ambition that prompted Lucifer to complain of the government of God and to seek the overthrow of the order which had been established in heaven. Since his fall, it has been his object to infuse the same spirit of envy and discontent, the same ambition for position and honor into the minds of men. Notice here the things that are associated together. You have envy and discontent. So envy and discontent go hand in hand. Together with that came the ambition for position and honor. Ambition for what? For position and honor. It is amazing they did not envy Moses' character. No, no, no. They did not envy the work that Moses was doing. They were simply envying what? His position and his honor. That's what they were after. And that's all they wanted. He thus worked on the minds of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram to arouse the desire for self-exaltation and excite envy, distrust, and rebellion. Satan caused them to reject God as their leader by rejecting the men of God's appointment. So Satan was successful in doing what? In having them reject God as their leader by doing what? By rejecting the men that God had appointed. Yet while in their murmuring against Moses and Aaron they blasphemed God, they were so deluded as to think themselves righteous and to regard those who had faithfully reproved their sins as actuated by Satan. So they really believed that they were righteous people. They did not think for a moment that they were unrighteous. They thought they were righteous. And yet, what is rebellion compared to? 
Let's look at 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 22 and 23. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 22 and 23. And Samuel said, Had the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is iniquity and idolatry. So rebellion is actually the sin of witchcraft. And this is what was the problem with these people. They, when they entered into rebellion, they were under a spell. They were under the power of witchcraft. Patriots and Prophets, 635. Patriots and Prophets, page 635. Rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Rebellion originated with Satan, and all rebellion against God is directly due to satanic influence. So when we rebel against God, it is due to satanic influences. Those who set themselves against the government of God have entered into an alliance with the arch apostate, and he will exercise his power and cunning to captivate the senses and mislead the understanding. So when we rebel against God's government, then we are actually rebelling together with Satan and have entered into an alliance together with him. This is why in, in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 17, Hebrews 13 and verse 17, God gives us some timely advice. Hebrews 13 and verse 17, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves for they watch for your souls as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. <clears throat> what is the greatest way that we can insult God? Patriarchs and Prophets, page 402. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 402. It is hardly possible for men to offer greater insult to God than to despise and reject the instrumentalities He would use for their salvation. Listen to this. It is hardly possible for men to offer greater insult to God than to despise and reject the instrumentalities He would use for their salvation. So when God sends people to instruct us in the truth, we reject that we are actually insulting God. Did this rebellion take place overnight? You know, sometimes we find a rebellion suddenly manifests itself. But did it come immediately or was there a process of time? Page Treasure Prophets, page 396. Patriots and Prophets, 396 to 397. Korah and his fellow conspirators were men who had been favored with special manifestations of God's power and greatness. They were of the number who went up with Moses into the mount and beheld the divine glory. Can you believe this? Korah and his fellow conspirators, who were they? They were people that had gone up to Mount Sinai. You remember when Moses went up Mount Sinai, he took Joshua with him and the elders. And around the mountain there was a fence put so no one gets beyond that fence. But these elders went beyond the fence. They went up to a closer relationship together with God. Korah was in that company. How could a man who's in that company come up there into the presence of God and suddenly find himself in direct rebellion against God. Notice here, but since that time, a change had come. A temptation, slight at first, had been harbored and had strengthened as it was encouraged until their minds were controlled by Satan and they ventured upon their work of disaffection. Notice here, what did they do? There was a small temptation, and they harbored this temptation until it became all-consuming. And how do they work among the people? Notice this, and you can identify this rebellion almost every time. It says, professing great interest in the prosperity of the people. 
they first whispered their discontent to one another and then to leading men of Israel. So notice here what happened. First, they professed great interest in the prosperity of the people. We are taking action right now. We need to do something for the sake of the people. This is what Korah began doing in the congregation. Their insinuations were so readily received that they ventured still further. And at last, they really believed themselves to be actuated by zeal for God. They really believed that what they were doing, they were doing for the cause of God. Now when you think about Moses, was Moses an overbearing ruler that caused this rebellion? Previous page, page 395. Patriarch and Prophets, page 395 to 396. The state of feeling among the people favored the designs of Korah. In the bitterness of their disappointment, remember they could not enter the promised land because they refused. And then God says, now you must spend 40 years in the wilderness. In the bitterness of their disappointment, their former doubts, jealousies, and hatred had returned, and again their complaints were directed against their patient leader. That was interesting to see, that Moses was their patient leader, and they began to attack their patient leader. The Israelites were continually losing sight of the fact that they were under the divine guidance they forgot that the angel of the covenant was their invisible leader that veiled by the cloudy pillar the presence of Christ went before them and that from him Moses received all his directions. Now how did these rebellion, rebellious people consider themselves? Oftentimes they, they looked and they saw Moses as this terrible tyrant. But how did they view themselves in this whole situation? Numbers chapter 16 and verse 3. And they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said unto them, Ye take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them. How do they feel? They felt that they were holy people. So what was the real problem? Why did they not like Moses? You know, they actually could come to the point in time they said, Yeah, we do like Moses. But what was the problem? Why do they not like Moses? And why is it today that people become disgruntled with leadership? The usual reason is given as follows. Volume 2, Testing for the Church, page 440. Volume 2, page 440. Some who occupy the position of watchmen to warn the people of danger have given up their watch and recline at ease. They are nice and easy. They're having a good time. They are unfaithful sentinels. They remain inactive while their wily foe enters the fort and works successfully by their side to tear down what God has commanded to be built up. They see that Satan is deceiving the inexperienced and unsuspecting, yet they take it all quietly as though they have no special interest, as though these things did not concern them. They apprehend no special danger. They see no cause to raise an alarm. To them everything seems to be going well, and they see no necessity of raising the faithful trumpet notes of warning which they hear borne by the plain testimonies to show the people their transgressions in the house of Israel their sins. These reproofs and warnings disturb the quiet of these sleepy, ease-loving sentinels, and they are not pleased. They say in heart, if not in words, this is all uncalled for. It is too severe, too harsh. These men are unnecessarily disturbed and excited and seem unwilling to give us any rest. You take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them. They are not willing that we should have any comfort, peace, or happiness. It is active labor, toil, and unceasing vigilance alone which will satisfy these unreasonable, hard to be suited watchmen. Why don't they prophesy smooth things and cry, Peace, peace? Then everything would move on smoothly. Oh, why these, these people, all they want to do is activity, activity, activity. There's too much activity. We don't want all that activity. What we want is a little bit of nice peaceful time. And these workers, these watchmen, which are represented by Moses and Aaron, all they want to do is work, 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 work. Activity, activity, activity. They're always concerned we need to stop this rebellion here or condemn this sin there. Oh, we're not satisfied with that. 
Notice in Patriarch and Prophets, page 397, it emphasizes this very point. It says, The next work of the conspirators was with the people. To those who are in the wrong and deserving reproof, there is nothing more pleasing than to receive sympathy and praise. So when somebody deserves reproof, we should never sympathize with them. With them. Because if we do, we're only encouraging them in their wrong. And thus Korah and his associates gained the attention and enlisted the support of the congregation. The charge that the murmurings of the people had brought upon them the wrath of God was declared all to be a mistake. They said that the congregation were not at fault since they desired nothing more than their rights. But that Moses was an overbearing ruler and that he had reproved the people as sinners when they were a holy people and the Lord was among them. You see, the problem is that Moses, the problem was Moses, it was not the people. You know, and Moses said, you are sinners, and that's why you cannot go into the promised land. They said, oh no, that's a mistake. The people are holy. How can you call a holy people sinners? How can you say that they don't belong in the promised land when they are righteous people and they should have the right to enter there? What else didn't they like about Moses? There was another problem. Page 397 in Patriarchs and Prophets. Korah reviewed the history of their travels through the wilderness, where they had been brought into straight places, and many had perished because of their murmuring and disobedience. His hearers thought they saw clearly that their troubles might have been prevented if Moses had pursued a different course. You know, if Moses had just done things a little bit differently, everything would be wonderful. They decided that all their disasters were chargeable to him and that their exclusion from Canaan was in consequence of the mismanagement of Moses and Aaron. Now, if Korah would be their leader and would encourage them by dwelling upon their good deeds instead of reproving their sins, they would have a very peaceful, prosperous journey. Instead of wandering to and fro in the wilderness, they would proceed directly to the promised land. You see, the problem is, Moses keeps saying, sinners, sinners, sinners. And we don't want to hear that. Now, we simply need to have a change of leadership. We need Korah instead of Moses. And what Korah is going to do, he is going to dwell upon our good deeds and not reprove. You heard that somewhere before? Have you heard that type of words before? Well, those words are nothing else than the Korah, Dathan, and Abiram leadership. Now, they were going to change some things. Now, let's see what they would change. Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, page 300. Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, page 300. Korah had cherished his envy and rebellion until he was self-deceived, and he really thought that the congregation was a very righteous people and that Moses was a tyrannical ruler, continually dwelling upon the necessity of the congregations being holy when there was no need of it, for they were holy. So, Korah kept thinking about this over and over again until he was convinced that he was right and that Moses really was a tyrant and that we need to be freed from the tyrannical rulership. These rebellious ones had flattered the people in general to believe that they were right and that all their troubles arose from Moses their ruler who was continually reminding them of their sins. The people thought that if Korah could lead them and encourage them and dwell upon their righteous acts instead of reminding them of their failures, they should be a very peaceful, prosperous journey. And he would without doubt lead them not back and forth in the wilderness, but into the promised land. So in reality, the Israelites were looking forward to a new order of things. They were looking for something new. Pages of Prophets, page 401 to 402. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 401 to 402. They were not willing to submit to this. They had to perish in the wilderness. And they tried to believe that Moses had deceived them. They had fondly cherished the hope that a new order of things was about to be established in which praise would be substituted for reproof and ease for anxiety and conflict. So from now on, we're going to have a new order of things. Instead of reproof, we shall have praise. Instead of conflict, we shall have ease. It was amazing 
what unity suddenly took place among these rebellious ones. Volume 3, Testament for the Church, page 345 and 346. Volume 3, 345 and 346. In this work of disaffection, there was greater harmony and union of views and feelings among these discordant elements than had ever been known to exist before. Wow, when they entered this rebellion, they were suddenly united. Greater unity than ever before in Israel. And they could point to that and say, look, you see, we are having the Spirit of God with us because we are now united. We are one body more than ever before we have unity. What a deception. Korah's success in gaining the larger part of the congregation of Israel on his side led him to feel confident that he was wise and correct in judgment and that Moses was indeed usurping authority that threatened the prosperity and salvation of Israel. To what extent did this rebellion lead them to? Volume 1, Spirit of Prophecy, 298 to 299. Volume 1, Spirit of Prophecy, 298 to 299. They accused Moses of being the cause of their not entering the promised land. They said that God had not dealt with them thus. He had not said that they should die in the wilderness. They would never believe that he had thus said, but that it was Moses who had said this, not the Lord, and that it was all arranged by Moses to never bring them to the land of Canaan. They spoke of his leading them from a land that flowed with milk and honey. What? They said that he had taken away, them away from a land that flowed with milk and honey. Wait a minute. Which land did they just leave from? Where did they just come from? Well, they came from Egypt. So what did they call Egypt? They called Egypt a land flowing with milk and honey. This is why it says, they forgot in their blind rebellion their sufferings in the land of Egypt and the desolating plagues brought upon the land. But they now accuse Moses of bringing them from a good land to kill them in the wilderness that he might be made rich with their possessions. <laughs> Who were they in Egypt? They were slaves. How much do slaves own? Nothing. So, if Moses took them out of Egypt to take all their possessions, they had nothing for him to take. They forgot all of that. It was only when Moses came there that they actually end up with some possessions. They forgot all of that. What blindness will do. Patriots and Prophets, page 398. For a time this work was carried on secretly. As soon, however, as the movement had gained sufficient strength to warrant an open rupture, Korah appeared at the head of the faction and publicly accused Moses and Aaron of usurping authority which Korah and his associates were equally entitled to share. So, so long as it was small, he kept quiet, low-key. But once he had enough people, he suddenly stood at the head of this whole rebellion. It was charged further that the people had been deprived of their liberty and independence. So what did they say? They said that the people were lost their liberty and independence because of the actions of Moses. Now what kind of liberty were they looking for? What kind of liberty and what kind of independence must we always say, speak against? Patriots and Prophets, page 404. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 404. The Hebrews were not willing to submit to the directions and restrictions of the Lord. What was the problem? The problem was the restrictions that God had placed upon them. They were restless under restraint and unwilling to receive reproof. This was the secret of their murmuring against Moses. What was the secret? What was it that they, they were wanting after? They wanted freedom to sin. They did not want the restrictions. Had they been left free to do as they pleased, there would have been fewer complaints against their leaders. So if Moses and Aaron did not give them restrictions, they would have been happy in the wilderness there with them. It's amazing, the next sentence. 
all through the history of the church, God's servants have had the same spirit to meet. Same spirit. A bit earlier on page 403, do not the same evil still exist that lay at the foundation of Korah's ruin? Pride and ambition are widespread. And when these are cherished, they open the door to envy and a striving for supremacy. The soul is alienated from God and unconsciously drawn into the ranks of Satan. Like Korah and his companions, many even of the professed followers of Christ are thinking, planning, and working so eagerly for self-exaltation that in order to gain the sympathy and support of the people, they are ready to pervert the truth falsifying and misrepresenting the Lord's servants and even charging them with the base and selfish motives that inspire their own hearts. So it's inside their own hearts and that is what is moving them. By persistently reiterating falsehood and that against all evidence, they at last come to believe it to be truth. While endeavoring to destroy the confidence of the people in the men of God's appointment, they really believe that they are engaged in a good work verily doing God's service. They come to the point of actually believing that what they are doing is the work of God. Every advance made by those whom God has called to lead in His work has excited suspicion. Every act has been misrepresented by the jealous and fault-finding. Thus it was in the time of Luther, of the Wesleys, and other reformers. Thus it is today. When we lift up the truth, when we reprove sin, suddenly the rebellious begin to complain and accuse the person that is doing the reproving of the very sins that exist in their own hearts. Great Controversy, page 343, we find that there has been, the same parallel has been in the experience of God's people from the very beginning to the end of time. In Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, page 306 to 308, tells us the reason why this was written down, this rebellion of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, this Aaron's Rod problem. Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, 306 to 308. The facts relative to Korah and his com company, who rebelled against Moses and Aaron and against Jehovah, are recorded for a warning to God's people, especially those who live upon the earth near the close of time. So what was the reason for, the, for God recording the experience of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram and the giving of Aaron's rod? For what reason? It is especially recorded for a warning for God's people, especially those who live upon the earth at the close of time. It is for our own time. Satan has led persons to imitate the example of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram in raising insurrection among the people of God. Those who permit themselves to rise in opposition to the plain testimony become self-deceived. Such have really thought that those upon whom God has laid the burden of His work were exalted above the people of God and that their counsels and reproofs were uncalled for. They have risen in opposition to the plain testimony which God would have His servants bear in rebuking the wrongs among His people. The testimony is born against hurtful indulgences as tea, coffee, snuff, and tobacco have irritated a certain class because it would destroy their idols. Many for a while were undecided whether to make an entire sacrifice of these th hurtful things or reject the plain testimonies born and yield to the clamors of appetite. They occupied an unsettled position. There was a conflict between their convictions of truth and their self-indulgence. Their state of indecision made them weak and with many, appetite prevailed. Their sense of sacred things were perverted by the use of these slow poisons, and they at length fully decided, let the consequences be what it might, they would not deny self. This fearful decision at once raised a wall of separation between them and those who were cleansing themselves, as God has commanded from all the filthiness of flesh and the spirit, and were perfecting holiness, holiness in the fear of God. Notice what the first thing that happened. The first thing was, they heard a message specifically against hurtful indulgences. And then what? The people were undecided. 
and this indecision weakened them. And after they were weakened, they decided to come up, May, we are not giving up our indulgence. And once they made that decision, immediately a wall of separation arose. That is what causes separation. Something happened the next day. Patriarch and Prophets, page 404, 405. Korah would not have taken the course he did had he known that all the directions and reproofs communicated to Israel were from God. You know, if Korah really knew that, the, that God was leading Moses and Aaron, he would never have made such a rebellion. Never. But you know what the next sentence says? But he might have known. In other words, he could have known that God was leading. God had given overwhelming evidence that he was leading Israel. But Korah and his companions rejected light until they became so blinded that the most striking manifestations of his power were not sufficient to convince them. They attributed them all to human or satanic agency. The same thing was done by the people who the day after the destruction of the men who had deceived them, they dared to attribute his judgments to Satan, declaring that through the power of the evil one, Moses and Aaron had caused the death of good and holy men. So the very next day what happened? The people blamed Moses and Aaron that they, through satanic agencies, destroyed these holy men in the wilderness and the earth was opened up. In other words, who destroyed them? God did. And they attributed that destruction instead of to God, to Satan. This reminds me oftentimes of people telling me God does not destroy. Well, the very next day these people said God does not destroy. It was Satan that did this. You know what happens? When they decided that God did not destroy them, that Satan destroyed them, it says further, it was this act that sealed their doom. That very belief sealed their doom. Why? They had committed the sin against the Holy Spirit, a sin by which man's heart is effectually hardened against the influence of divine grace. So in reality, the idea that God did not destroy those men, that Satan did, that was the sin against the Holy Ghost. And they lost their life. God could do no more with them. God could not help them any further. Patriarch and Prophets, page 635. Patriarch and Prophets, page 635. No stronger evidence can be given of Satan's delusive power than that many who are thus led by him deceive themselves with the belief that they are in the service of God. When Korah, Dathan, and Byron rebelled, rebelled against the authority of Moses, they thought they were opposing only a human leader, a man like themselves, and they came to believe that they were verily doing God's service. They came to the point of really believing that they were serving God. But in rejecting God's instrument, they rejected Christ. They insulted the Spirit of God. So in the days of Christ, the Jewish scribes and elders who professed great zeal for the honor of God crucified His Son. The same Spirit still exists in the hearts of those who set themselves to follow their own will in opposition to the will of God. Before we move on in this experience, I want to summarize what we have gotten so far. Number one, the cause for that rebellion began with jealousy. That's right. They were first jealous of the authority of Moses and Aaron. Then they began to be envious and then rebellious. 
that rebellion was because in order to build themselves up, instead of doing hard work, they began to destroy someone else's work. And I find this quite interesting in the work of God till today. Some people want to build themselves as workers. Instead of working hard and building up the work of God, they begin to destroy someone else. That is rebellion. And if you are one of those, I really urge you to, instead of doing that, spend your energies on building up the abilities that God has given you, and God will lead you to the best that He feels that you should have. Then, in order to build themselves up, they looked around to see if the leaders reproved anybody. And sure enough, they reproved a lot of people. So what did they do? They gathered among the people that were reproved and said, Oh, come on, Moses is a tyrant. You know, Moses, he did not use the right methods. No, no. Moses was too harsh with you. Moses was, he was condemning you, and yet you're a righteous person. You're a good person. And they kept talking about these things over and over again until what happened? They actually believed it. And once they believed it, they went into full-fledged rebellion. They got the people on their side and they stood up against Moses and Aaron. As a result, what did God do? God wanted to make it very clear that He was not interested in a new order of things in which praise would be substituted for reproof. No, the Aaron's and Moses's, their leadership represented those who are not afraid to give a voice of rebuke to the people. They were not afraid to do that. And because of that, in Numbers chapter 17, we find there that to identify that type of leadership, God had all the tribes bring their rods into the sanctuary. And that rod which budded was the rod that God wanted to use. And Aaron's rod was the one that budded, and it blossomed almonds. By the way, have you wondered what those almonds taste like? Do you have any interest in tasting one of those almonds? I never thought about it for a long time, but um, I'll read to you from the Word to the Little Flock, page 16. It says, In the ark beneath where the angel's wings were spread was a golden pot of manna of a yellowish cast, and I saw a rod which Jesus said was Aaron's. I saw it bud, blossom, and bear fruit. And I saw two long golden rods on which hung silver wires, and on the wires most glorious grapes, one cluster was more than a man here could carry. And I saw Jesus step up and take of the manna, almonds, grapes, and pomegranates, and bear them down to the city and place them on the supper table. I stepped up to see how much was taken away, and there was just as much left, and we shouted, Hallelujah, Amen. So a vision was taken to that future time that Aaron's rod was taken up there in the heavenly sanctuary. And there Jesus stepped up to it. He took the almonds, he took the manna, and he put it on the table. And the righteous, the redeemed, they will have a chance to eat of it. And after they've eaten of it, she looked to see how much was left. The same amount as when they began. So this Reproving leadership was the type of leadership that God wanted to remain among the people of Israel. But Israel was not satisfied. After they left the wilderness and they entered into the promised land, they went through the period of the judges. During the period of the judges, God would bring up a judge to them. And finally one day they said, we're tired of this system, we want to have something different. Let us look at 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 4 through 9. 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 4 through 9. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel and to Ramah. 
and said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they had said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should reign over them. According to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, even unto this day, wherewith they have forsaken me and served other gods, so do they also unto thee. Now therefore hearken unto their voice, Howbeit yet protest solemnly unto them, and show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. What happened? They got tired of this system. And they said, we want a king, we want to be like all the other nations. We're not satisfied to be different from all the other nations. And finally, what did God do? Hosea chapter 13 and verse 11 records the reason why God gave them a king. Hosea chapter 13 and verse 11 says, I gave thee a king in mine anger and took him away in my wrath. Why did God give Israel a king? Because they insisted on it and God gave it to them in His anger. They continually rejected the reproofs. They wanted to have a king that did not reprove them. And sure enough, they got a wicked king just as wicked as themselves and they ended up in captivity and were destroyed as a people. For that reason, they rejected Aaron's rod. They rejected that priesthood that God appointed who were willing to reprove the people for their sins. That is whom they rejected. What about in our own day? We have read in Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, page 306, that the facts relative to Korah and his company who rebelled against Moses and Aaron and against Jehovah are recorded for a warning to God's people, especially those who live upon the earth near the close of time. So the reason that these things are written were written for our time. So what are we to know about our time? What type of people represent the Aaron's Rod leadership today. Let us look at Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah chapter 58 and verse 1. What is the message that we have to bear to the world? Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgressions and the house of Jacob their sins. What are we to expect in these last days? Volume 8, page 232 to 233. Volume 8, 232 to 233. In this age, just prior to the second coming of Christ in the clouds of heaven, such a work as that of John is to be done. God calls for men who will prepare a people to stand in the great day of the Lord. The message preceding the public ministry of Christ was repent, publicans and sinners. Repent, Pharisees and Sadducees. Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. As a people who believe in Christ soon appearing, we have a message to bear. Prepare to meet thy God. Our message must be as direct as was the message of John. What does it say here? Our message must be as direct as was the message of John. He rebuked kings for their iniquity, notwithstanding that his life was imperiled. He did not hesitate to declare God's word. And our work in this age must be done as faithfully. So what is our message as a people? Our message is not, oh, everything is okay, don't worry. No, our message is repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. How can we prepare to do such a work? Volume 8, 333. Volume 8, 333. In order to give such a message as John gave, we must have a spiritual experience like his. If we want to have the same type of message as John the Baptist had, we must first have a spiritual experience. 
We don't give the message first and then have the spiritual experience. Oh no, we have the spiritual experience first, then and only then can we give that message. This is why it's so tragic whenever I hear someone go to the pulpit and speak about the things that should be done by the people, the reformations that need to be made, and then they say, oh, but I'm not like that. I remember visiting one man who was telling me, he says, I am really tired in the church that I'm in. They refuse to hear me speak about health reform. They refuse to listen to any message I have on health reform. And he says, this is totally wrong. He says, all they ever do is they keep pointing to the cigarettes in my pocket and I keep telling them that has nothing to do with it. Oh, but it does have something to do with it. It says here, first we must have the experience ourselves and then share that with others. In order to give such a message as John gave, we must have a spiritual experience like his. The same work must be wrought in us. We must behold God and in beholding Him lose sight of self. John had by nature the faults and weaknesses common to humanity. Yes, he had the same weaknesses as you and I have. But the touch of divine love had transformed him. When after Christ's ministry began, the disciple of John came to him with a complaint that all men were following the new teacher. John showed how clearly he understood his relation to the Messiah and how gladly he welcomed the one for whom he had prepared the way. Imagine that. Have you heard lately? Oh, I, he must increase, but I must decrease. Have you heard of that? That is the true message of John the Baptist. A man can receive nothing, he said, except to be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom which standeth and heareth him rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy therefore is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. Now what kind of messages did John the Baptist give? on page 332 of the same book, with no elaborate arguments or fine-spun theories did John declare the message. He did not come up to see how eloquently he can speak it. He did not figure out some new theories to awaken the people with. No, with no elaborate arguments or fine-spun theories did John declare his message. Startling and stern, yet full of hope. His voice was heard from the wilderness. Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. With a new strange power it moved the people. The whole nation was stirred. Multitudes flocked to the wilderness. Again, 333 to 334. John had risen to the height of self-abnegation. He sought not to attract men to himself, but to lift their thoughts higher and still higher until they should rest upon the Lamb of God. He kept lifting them higher away from himself, pointing, Lo, behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. He himself had been only a voice, a cry in the wilderness. Now with joy he accepted silence and obscurity that the eyes of all might be turned to the light of life. Those who are true to their calling as messengers for God will not seek honor for themselves. Love for self will be swallowed up in love for Christ. They will recognize that it is their work to proclaim as did John the Baptist, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. They will lift up Jesus and with Him humanity will be lifted up. Thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabited eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in a high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. The soul of the prophet, emptied of self, was filled with the light of the divine. In words that were almost a counterpart of the words of Christ himself, he bore witness to the Savior's glory. He that cometh from above, he said, is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly, and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above. For he whom God had sent speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. In this glory of Christ, all his followers are to share. The Savior could say, I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which sent me. And declared John, the Father giveth 
not the Spirit by measure unto Him. So are the followers of Christ. We can receive of heaven's light only as we are willing to be emptied of self. When can we receive heaven's light? Only as we are willing to be emptied of ourselves. We can discern the character of God and accept Christ by faith only as we consent to the bringing into captivity of every thought to the obedience of Christ. To all who do this, the Holy Spirit is given without measure. In Christ dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in Him. In order for us to be able to give the message represented by Aaron's rod, we must have the experience that these men had. We must have the experience of John the Baptist. We cannot reprove anyone of sin unless we ourselves have the experience of God. We must first examine our hearts. We must first examine ourselves before we go around examining someone else. Before we give a voice of reproof, we must ourselves come into line. This is where the power of God is. In our day, we are also to meet the modern Korah, Dathan and Abirams. And who are they? Volume 5, Testing for the Church, page 66. Volume 5, Testing for the Church, page 66. So it is with many among our people who have drifted away from the old landmarks and who have followed their own understanding. What a great relief it would be to such could they quiet their conscience with the belief that my work is not of God. But your unbelief, this is Ellen G. White speaking, but your unbelief will not change the facts in the case. You are defective in character, in moral and religious experience. Close your eyes to the facts if you will, but this does not make you one particle more perfect. The only remedy is to wash in the blood of the Lamb. Notice this. If you seek to turn aside the counsel of God to suit yourselves, if you lessen the confidence of God's people in the testimonies He has sent them, you are rebelling against God as certainly as were Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. God has given to us the testimonies, the spirit of prophecy. If anyone who lessens the confidence of God's people in these testimonies, what are they doing? They are doing the work of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. That's right. And what is the biggest complaint? Oh, there's too many reproofs in there. That's right. We need those reproofs. God has given them to us. And those ministers who agree with these testimonies, and repeat these testimonies, they often suffer the same consequence like Korah gave to Moses. Now we know that in 1844, God had revealed once again to His people the Ark of the Covenant. Inside the Ark was Aaron's rod. Therefore, as part of manna is revealed to us today in the principles of health reform and especially a non-flesh diet, Aaron's rod must also represent something. It represents those leaders that are appointed by God to get, do His work. Now remember, these leaders may not necessarily have the right to be leaders as far as inheritance is concerned. Reuben should have been the leader. Next to Reuben was Simeon. Next to Simeon was Judah. Next to Judah was Levi. Why was it that the spiritual leadership came to Levi? Why was Simeon bypassed. Why? Why was Reuben passed by? It is because they tolerated sin in their life. So God is going to choose a particular leadership in our last days. Is that leadership going to be organized? Is it go this message of reproof that is given there by John the Baptist, 
Is that message going to be given to the world in an organized fashion? If so, how is it going to be organized? We'll have to leave that for our next study.